Let's open our Bibles to God's word this morning. Growing up in a Pentecostal home, I have noticed that the tendency by some in the charismatic churches is to limit the power of the Holy Spirit to speaking in tongues and prophesying. And that is on one extreme of the charismatic Pentecostals. But then there are other Protestant denomination who uh, limit the spirit's movement to personal character formation, order, and discipline. While all these are needed and is the work of the Holy Spirit, the question I want to ask is, is it all that is needed to lead a spirit-led life? Or do we have a, not a good understanding of what the working and the mission of the Holy Spirit is? One of the most neglected subjects today at church is the work and the mission of the Holy Spirit in church and in the life of a believer. Without the Holy Spirit, one cannot live a holy life. One cannot serve the Lord and one cannot understand the scripture the way we need to understand the scripture. Well, this morning I want to bring to a message entitled, A Spirit-Led Life. How to live a spirit-led life. Why did Jesus send the Holy Spirit? That's what we're going to see. And what is the role of the Spirit of God and what it is to be like a person who is totally led by the Spirit of God. Well, last week I started off a little bit by telling you that the Holy Spirit is God and we serve a triune God in the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And that is the fundamental faith of all Christians believe in the Trinity. There is no hierarchy in the Trinity and there is functional equality in the Trinity and all Christians agree on this Trinity. And the Holy Spirit the Son, Jesus Christ, and God the Father was working together. We saw from Colossians, we saw from John chapter 1, and we saw from the Genesis chapter 1 and 2 that they were together. The triune God was working together in the creation. And even today, God works as a team, uh, as the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So when we mention about the personality of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is present right from the creation. But when Jesus came and did his earthly ministry, the Spirit of God was sent in a very powerful way to empower the New Testament church for its mission and the New Testament life. And we find that in Acts of the Apostles chapter 2 and it's verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came down from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. In other words, it is much different than the work of the Spirit in the Old Testament. Now the Spirit of God has come and descended upon the church, the members, every member, male, female, Greek, Jew, slave, you name it, everybody who is saved and born again and come into the family of God has been given the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So the key feature of the Holy Spirit is the sense of heaven in our midst, not in the sense of the place of heaven, but in the experience of heaven, a foretaste of the blessed future that awaits each and every one of us is already present to us now in reality by the blessed Holy Spirit in all its fullness and wholeness and beauty. Heaven has invaded earth by the means of the Holy Spirit. So when you and I are having the Holy Spirit, the blessed Holy Spirit with us, we are able to live that heavenly lifestyle right now in this world. That's why the scholar, God in Fee, he says, because the spirit has invaded and God's nature has infected human hearts. It's like an infection. 
once the spirit of god has infected human hearts it starts growing it starts spreading and we come under the fullness of the holy spirit and he says when the spirit has invaded and god's nature has infected human hearts and because the very power that raised jesus from the dead is accessible to believers the church should live differently as a colony of heaven as people who experience heaven and who have the lifestyle of heaven right now practicing in this world as we are living in this world can i hear an amen church and that's the ministry of the holy spirit a foretaste of the future we are living in the tension of these two worlds by the power of the holy spirit we have been given the deposit that heavenly deposit by which we can live a godly spiritual righteous life which is about the day to come but we must also understand that we are living in a world and flesh which is worldly and the true christian lives in this good tension between the coming world and the world that he is in and paul captures in his writings about the coming age and the deposit of the holy spirit that we are living the believers of god when you come into faith you are already living in this world and the flesh is with us but at the same time we have been given the deposit of the holy spirit in us so we are living in between the ages we are living in this world age and the heavenly age and what helps us live that heavenly life is the deposit of the holy spirit paul says in 1st Corinthians chapter 10 verse 11 these things have happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of ages has come in other words we are living in between two ages two worlds the world in its reality and the kingdom of god that is already in us in second corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 paul says therefore if anyone is in christ the new creation has come in this earthly body we have received the new creation but externally in our physical body we are the body of this world so look at how paul captures how the holy spirit works in us for the new creation lifestyle yet we are surrounded in this flesh the flesh wants us to do the things of the flesh but the spirit enables us to overcome flesh and to live for god and to live a heavenly lifestyle while we are living right in this world in other words heaven have invaded the planet or earth and put its flag by the means of the cross of christ and when somebody receives the lord jesus christ we become a citizen of heaven an ambassador of god and the spirit of god enables us to live a holy life so we hold on to this tension paul says i do what i don't want to do and sometimes i don't do what i have to do so there is a tension that is happening because the world is calling us to live according to the world the worldly passions the worldly desires the worldly lifestyle but the deposit that is in us through the word of god the holy spirit is calling us to live in the heavenly lifestyle and if we don't hold this tension wisely we can go either on a heavenly overdrive or we can go on a worldly overdrive and that's exactly what happened to the corinthian church the people over some of them were on a heavenly overdrive for them everything is about the spirit and the manifestation of the spirit so some women abstain from their family relationship with their husband because what happened they forgot that suddenly they are a part of this world and a part of the family and they went on a heavenly overdrive but on the other side if you don't have the tension properly and you feel that okay the holy spirit is in me but i am in this world i need to live for making something in this world we may also go on a earthly overdrive that's where in corinthians paul mentions about a man sleeping with his father's wife where he is in the church but he is on a worldly overdrive yes the spirit of god is there in him but he is too much into the world but on the other side this woman who abstained from relation ships from their husband on an earthly way they were on a heavenly overdrive and that's the balance that you and i need to have in our christian lives 
not to be too heavenly overdrive not to on an earthly overdrive but to live out that heavenly lifestyle and that lifestyle and the word of god and the spirit of god in us will dictate the terms on how i deal with the world how i deal with my family how i deal with my relationships and how i deal with my job and other things in this world and that is the work of the holy spirit to enable us to live successful lives heavenly lives balancing our responsibilities and the realities of the fallen world so what is the mission of the holy spirit what are the signs of a spirit led life in a believer's life first of all i want to quickly go on because i have a lot to cover i know that we all know about the holy spirit but sadly we don't hear much messages on the holy spirit nowadays it's all about what you can get when you come to the presence of god but the bible is about what the lord can do when you surrender yourself totally under the influence of the holy spirit the holy spirit is the agent or the person in trinity that brings conviction of sin in our lives in john chapter 16 was 8 and 9 jesus said when he comes he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment about sin have you ever noticed that we are living in this world and we get up end up doing something and uh, suddenly there is an inner voice that comes out of you and talks to you and says stop shine that's not right i think you should not do this you are a child of god now who gives that inner voice who is the person who is speaking to us and telling us that you need to caution this you need to think before you do this because it's not right it is the holy spirit talking to us bringing conviction of sin in our day to day lives right from our regeneration experience but born again experience all through our life because paul says beautifully that we are saved and we are being saved every day and finally we will be saved at the return of the lord jesus christ and in this process not only on our uh, salvation experience but on a regular basis day to day basis it is the spirit of god that speaks to us and convicts us of our sin secondly moving forward once we are convicted of our sin it is the holy spirit that leads us to repentance it is the holy spirit why we should cry and ask god to forgive us it is the spirit of god that leads us in second timothy chapter 2 verse 25 paul says opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that god will grant them repentance leading them to a knowledge of the truth so god grants repentance through the medium of the holy spirit that god has given to us in acts chapter 11 verse 18 when they heard the message they had no further objections and praised god saying so then even to gentiles god has granted repentance that leads to life so the holy spirit is god with us leading us into conviction of sins and also uh leading us into repentance and forgiveness in the presence of god and what happens when we repent of our sin and when we convicted of our sins and we ask god for repentance we go through that regeneration experience that new life experience is not only a one time for a believer yes when you are born again and you appropriate the death and the resurrection of christ in our lives we are born again okay all of a sudden we are born again but then we are living in this world and we bump our heads into sin not wantingly sometimes wantingly sometimes unknowingly and when the holy spirit brings conviction in our lives and we ask god for forgiveness who brings that vitality of christ life in us who brings that oneness with god with us it is the blessed holy spirit that regenerates us every day as our helper as our advocate working with us to perfect us to make us holy and give us the life of god in us the holy spirit regenerates us and what happens as a result of that the holy spirit indwells every believer every one of us have got the deposit of the holy spirit has got the seal of the holy spirit growing up i came in an understanding that you are only filled with the holy spirit when you speak in tongues but when you study the bible you understand that the moment you are drawn to christ one cannot come to christ without the holy spirit calling you to christ 
and one cannot be born again unless the holy spirit works in you to bring conviction of your sins and repentance so i think that is a little too much to tell that if you are only speaking in tongues you have got the holy spirit but according to the bible romans chapter 8 verse 9 you however are not in the realm of the flesh but are in the realm of the spirit for if indeed the spirit of god lives in you every one of them in church at rome paul is telling them whether you speak in tongues or you don't speak in tongues if you are a child of god and you worship jesus christ and you have received him as the lord of your life amen the bible says that you have the holy spirit of god right inside of you can i hear an amen church amen the holy spirit indwells every believer and that's why paul says in first corinthians 6:19 don't you know that your bodies are the temples of the holy spirit in this case in first corinthians chapter 6 paul is talking about our individual body as the residing place as the presence of god comes and dwells in us who is in you where is the holy spirit in me in us in our child of god when he is born again from that moment the holy spirit who is in us and whom have we received the holy spirit from whom you have received from god you are not your own so the holy spirit indwells believers to help us the holy spirit the according to jesus word is our helper our advocate someone who comes alongside us in john chapter 14 verse 16 and 17 Jesus said I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate helper to help you and be with you forever which is that spirit it is the spirit of truth in verse 17 it says the holy spirit indwells every believer and is our advocate is our helper in the times of need in john chapter 14 verse 26 but the advocate the holy spirit whom the father will send in my name will teach you so the holy spirit is also our teacher to teach us what is right to teach the word of god to teach us when the word of god is proclaimed who is doing the work it is the work of the holy spirit to teach you all things and to remind you of everything i have said to you so it is a ministry of the spirit to take what is taught or to take what is written in the bible and to remind to us the scripture regarding sin righteousness and god it is the work of the holy spirit have you ever noticed that you are in a particular situation in your life and you do not know what to do you do not know what decisions to take but suddenly you are reminded of a scripture and who reminds you that scripture it is the work of the holy spirit working right within your lives he is our helper he is our teacher and he is our uh, reminds us of everything of jesus words and it's a duty it's a work of the holy spirit to glorify us in john chapter 16 verse 14 he will glorify me uh, because it is from me that he will receive what he will make me uh, known to you in other words the holy spirit glorifies christ to us and it is the holy spirit that leads us in our christian lives and leads us to glory in the coming of the lord jesus christ we are sealed by the holy spirit for the redemption not only for this world but for the redemption of the coming of the lord in ephesians chapter 1 was 13 and 14 paul says when you believed you were marked with him with a seal he's talking about the holy spirit you were marked in him with a seal the promised holy spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are god's possession to the praise of his glory we are sealed by the holy spirit for our redemption for our glorification when christ comes god has given us the deposit how wonderful dear friends the ministry of the holy spirit is we are not alone we are not alone in this world we have been given the power of the holy spirit the third person of trinity coming and residing right with us so that we can be matured and be redeemed at the coming of the lord and savior jesus christ so what do we understand from the holy spirit 
we understand from learning the old testament and the new testament it is the coming of the spirit is god's promise fulfilled upon his people the his presence return to his people growing up in the garden of eden adam and eve enjoyed the presence of god in the garden so but when they sinned they had to be sent out of the garden and then god calls the nation called israel and he says to them that i will be with you my presence will be with you and you are my people and my spirit my presence is going to be with you and you know the story when moses comes down from mount sinai and he sees the children of israel worshiping the golden calf his heart breaks down and he goes back to god he's so angry that these people have soon left god who is walking with them taking them to the promised land and god was very angry with his people and god said in exodus chapter 33 and his verse 3 go up to the land flowing with milk and honey but i will not go with you because you are a stiff neck people and i might destroy you on the way god said you are going away from me you are worshiping man made images so i'm going to withdraw my spirit i'm going to withdraw my presence and look at the prayer of moses and i think this is the prayer that jesus is reminding his children to ask for the holy spirit and i think this is the prayer that paul is when he is writing about the holy spirit reminding the church to pray and look at what moses prayed in exodus chapter 33 verse 15 and 16 then moses said to him if your presence does not go with us do not send us up from here we don't want to go anywhere without your presence lord how will anyone verse 16 know that you are pleased with me and your people unless you go with us what else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth it is your spirit it is your presence right with us and god forgave them god went with them to the promised land his presence was symbolized in the tabernacle and later in the temple when they built in the most holy place but the children like the worship of the calf they kept going away from god and god kept warning them i'm going to take my presence away if you do not repent and come back to me i have given you my sweet presence that has led you so far but repent and come back to me from your idolatrous ways but israel did not listen judah did not listen and finally god said enough is enough i'm going to withdraw my presence from the temple and from your people come with me to ezekiel chapter 10 and this verse 18 then the glory of the lord departed from over the threshold of the temple and stopped above the cherubim enough is enough god said i'm just going to withdraw my presence because these people are stiff neck people and they are running away from me but god was faithful even though he took the glory of god his presence from his people he kept coming back to the children of israel and prophesying and promising to them that he is going to come in a new way in a powerful way by jesus christ and his spirit coming thereafter come with me to jeremiah chapter 31 and this verse 31 the prophet said the days are coming declares the lord when i will make a new covenant with the people of israel and with the people of judah in other words god said that i am going to come in a very special way i am going to make a new covenant with them and what is that covenant ezekiel chapter 36 verse 26 the lord God spoke through Ezekiel and he said I will give you a new heart and and put a new spirit in you if I have taken my presence from the temple I am going to plan to come back in a very powerful way where I am going to put my spirit on all the believers of God in a very powerful way where you don't have to go to a place to worship God but the very temple and the dwelling place of God God will be in the hearts of people and that's what God is prophesying in 36 verse 26 I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh by the ministry of the holy spirit and that's the promise of God that Paul picks up 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and is verse 16 don't you know that you yourselves are god's temple don't you remember that god's presence departed his spirit departed from the temple and on the day of pentecost the spirit of god has come upon god's people and when you come and gather in the church you yourselves are the temple of god and don't you know that you yourselves are god's temple and that god's spirit dwells in your midst now i wanted to make a little note over here in first corinthians 6 paul talks about don't you know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Holy Spirit that is talking about a believer when we receive the Lord Jesus Christ the presence of God comes and dwells in us and our body becomes the temple of God but in this first Corinthians chapter 3 verse 16 Paul is not talking about our body as the temple of the Holy Spirit as much as our bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit when we come together in the assembly of the saints when the church comes together and assembles paul is addressing the church don't you know that you yourselves every one of us filled with the power of the holy spirit when we come together on a sunday morning or a carol or a fasting prayer we become the dwelling place of god where heaven kisses earth and experience of god and the ministry of god can be felt in the working of the spirit when the people of god assemble in the name of the lord jesus christ amen We don't come here to please people. We don't come here to socialize. Everything is secondary, but we come here to experience God as he comes down on Sunday morning to meet with his people in the temple called as the local church. Can I hear an amen church? Amen. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. In order to recapture the heaven invasion on our lives, the contemporary church has to first remember who we are we are the dwelling place of god his very presence is present right in our midst as we worship him and give him the glory god is a spirit and those who worship him worship him in spirit and in truth that's why we come in awe when we worship god All of our songs are about glorifying God. Our giving is for the work of the Lord. Our worshiping and the hearing of God's word is to lift up Jesus and let the Holy Spirit do its work in maturing the saints because God is present when his people gather and worship the living God. Moving forward. God is not only present in the church and present in a believer as a temple. but the spirit empowers god's people in both ordinary and extraordinary ways the spirit of god empowers us in our ordinary day to day life and our extraordinary working of the spirit that's the next point the spirit empowers god's people in both ordinary and extraordinary ways one uh, scholar said The living God is a God of power and by the spirit the power of the living God is present with us and for us. This is the words of Gordon Fee an amazing scholar if you get to read his writings please go and read he's a wonderful new testament scholar and he said the living God is a God of power and by the spirit the power of the living God is present with us and for us for what to empower us what does the holy spirit empower you and i to do in the kingdom of god in our day to day lives number 1 look at acts of the apostles what did the holy spirit empower the church to do witness about the lord jesus christ it is not that i went go and speak the gospel to somebody and somehow i have to convince him i have to debate with him no my intention is to share the gospel and when i share the gospel with somebody x y or z it's not my duty to convince that person it is the spirit who convicts the people of their sin 
and the holy spirit empowers me for sharing the word of god sharing the gospel in acts chapter 1 verse 8 but you will receive power when the holy spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses says jesus in jerusalem and in all judea samaria and to the ends of the earth and you saw how the new testament church was empowered by the holy spirit everybody in asia heard about jesus christ and the gospel empowered by the holy spirit today the church has to work by this empowerment to take the gospel to the ends of our city ends of our nation and the ends of the world and god has already empowered us to share the gospel and witness regarding the lord jesus christ the second reason why the spirit empowers us is to strengthen us in adversity and gives great power and endurance to every single believer when you go through difficulties in life when you go through loneliness when you go through a challenging situation in your life you are not alone when people are scheming against you and you do not know what to do and you feel that i'm all alone lord i'm helpless what is the ministry of the holy spirit is to strengthen the believers in adversity you are not alone you have been given the deposit of the holy spirit by which the triune god comes and makes his residence in us so that we are empowered for every situation of our life may it be ministry maybe i am going through a trial i am going through a challenging situation but i am not alone i have a well i can dig deep into that is the well of the holy spirit and if i am careful i will find my help i will find my support i will find my joy from the holy spirit for every circumstances regarding my life and that's the ministry of the holy spirit in our lives Amen dear friends when you go through challenges when you go through situations of life i don't know maybe you are going through some situation right now you are not alone you have the helper the holy spirit to strengthen you in colossians chapter 1 verse 12 paul says being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience So it's the Holy Spirit that strengthens us. In uh, First Thessalonians chapter one verse six, talking about the Thessalonians, he says, "For you welcome the message of the gospel in the midst of severe suffering, with the joy given by the Holy Spirit." So in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our trials, who gives us the strength? Who gives us the joy? it is a work of the holy spirit gives us strength and power for each day in our life no matter what the trials in life is maybe you're going through a difficult situation right now you have strength right where you are by the power of the holy spirit that's why paul says in second corinthians 4 7 to 12 but we have this treasure in jars of clay that's talking about his own body to show that this all surpassing power from god so what is the power that is with us all surpassing dynamic power the dynamic power of the holy spirit is from god and is not from us we don't operate on our flesh we don't operate in our own calculations that means we are operating in our flesh dear friends of god if you are doing ministry in your own mind and calculations it is working in our flesh but when you allow the holy spirit as the partner of your ministry and allow the holy spirit to take control over your ministry over what you are doing for the lord allow the holy spirit to take control of your family and your situations you know that this all surpassing power of god will take control and he will direct you in the path of the truth and he will use you for the glory of god's name can i hear an amen church It's time that we let the Holy Spirit lead us rather than we doing many things in our lives and for God. Moving forward, another empowerment of the Holy Spirit is to live holy lives. Holy life is a mark of a true believer. We have been given an infection of heaven the moment we are born again. What happens if a COVID-19 infection comes to anybody? so that covid virus is very powerful isn't it in 5 to 6 days we saw how the virus spreads and takes the whole person in control likewise 
when we receive the lord jesus christ we have been infected by heaven yes we are living in this world but slowly and steadily this grows in our midst and all the sinful areas slowly get dealt with those rough edges why because this heavenly infection is growing in me the spirit of god is growing in me and it enables me to lead a holy life paul has no excuse for a believer who continues in sin yes we bump our nose sometimes and we get up and we walk but every time we walk we are closing our eyes and bumping our nose there's something wrong with us and that's the picture that paul gives for a believer who continues in their sin there is no easy words for somebody who continues in sin because there is holy spirit inside of us and when the spirit of god is working inside of us if we have to sin continually that means we are we are suppressing the unction of the spirit and voluntarily going ahead and living a sinful life it's not that we can completely come out of uh, sin and live a perfect life but if there is a continual habitual sin that we are still struggling with it is the ministry of the holy spirit to enable us to live holy life why because in first corinthians chapter 3 verse 17 paul says god's temple is sacred look at that word and you together are the temple when i have become the temple of god i have to bring this temple of god under the work of the holy spirit so that there is holiness in my life we have far far come away from the first century standards of holiness there were times where believers will not go to a theater to see film because they don't want to sit with worldly people and enjoy the worldly kind of entertainment but now the world has come right into our living rooms but as we enjoy this gadgets and this phones and as we are aligning ourselves with the entertainments of this world have you ever thought what is a spirit led life supposed to do how we live in this world and keep ourselves separate from being polluted from this world it's the work of the holy spirit what kind of entertainments have we brought into our homes what kind of places where we are now freely visiting where our forefathers would not visit those places we have brought down the value of christian living and my fear is that if this generation has brought down the value of christian holiness this low where is our next generation heading what are the landmarks we are giving to our next generation to follow the holy spirit is a spirit of holiness and when the holy spirit takes control of somebody they will grow from holiness to holiness in forgiveness and if they fall down they repent and they lead a holy life and may the blessed holy spirit give all of us including me the grace to live a holy life in this corrupt generation moving forward i will quickly move forward and finish the ministry of the holy spirit when we come together as a church is to make the many one all of us when we come from our different homes if i come to your homes today afternoon some of you may be having biryanis some of you may be having an afghan food because people are here from different places some may be having a north indian food some may be having a kerala tamil nadu food chetnad or andhra meals right some of you may be having an american food because people representing over here right over here we are from various places various languages various cultures and various upbringings but what is the speciality of the spirit of god when we come together makes us one in the body of christ the unity the unity that we see in the godhead the father the son and the holy spirit will transfer from the head who is christ to the body who is the church and there is no divisions in the church amen is a spirit of god that brings unity if my church is all about this culture group and if my church is all about this language group then we have caused some dent in the unity of the spirit because god's kingdom the heavenly kingdom all tribe all nations 
everybody, look at Revelation, is there in the throne room of God. And if I am a true born again believer and the Holy Spirit resides in me, I will be open in the spirit to accept other people's culture and consider them as my own. I will not judge them the way they dress, the way they talk, the way they behave. Why? Because we are all coming from various backgrounds. Heaven is not only from South Indian people. Heaven is not only from North Indian people. Heaven is a mix of people from every ethnic and people group. And we learn to accept each other's culture. We learn to accept each other's differences. Yet what makes us one is that we are the body of Christ and we are united by the power of the Holy Spirit. Can you give a clap of into God this morning time. Come on everybody. The unity of the spirit. When we divide into language barriers and culture barriers, we are bringing disunity in the spirit of God, in the body of Christ and working against the spirit of God. And when there is a fight in the church, when denominations start fighting, we are denting our effectiveness of the gospel no matter what denomination we are, or no matter where we worship God, or what language we are, we are united by the single body of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are won by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Look at how Paul talks about it in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3 to 6. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. Look at Paul's emphasis on the Spirit. It's much beyond speaking in tongues. It's much beyond jumping in church. It's much beyond wearing a white and white dress. I'm not nullifying the need of all that. But Paul says that the spirit has to get into every cells of your body. And you and I need to be directed by the spirit. Not only in our own bodies but also in the church when we come and worship God. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit just as you were called to one hope. When you were called one Lord, verse 5, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. Talking about the unity, right? Come to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. For we were all baptized by one spirit. There is no different spirit in Africa, and there's no different spirit in India. I remember going to African nations and uh, worshipping God. You know that the, how the Holy Spirit leads in the churches? You would go back losing five kgs on Sunday morning. Oh my God, they dance and they worship God. And I danced with them. When I went to Africa, can you imagine three hours service and I would dance with them in the, their kind of dance. And that's the Spirit leading over there. I cannot be judgmental. No, in India, the Spirit is different. No. Dear friends, we are all one in the body of Christ. Sometimes there is a cultural influence to our, the kind of worship that we have. Right? The kind of worship that we have. But you go to different parts of the world, the spirit leads Christian worships in very different ways. And we need to be open on how the Lord leads us. In uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, we were all baptized by one spirit as to form one body whether Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free, there is no special concession for the Jews. Jews, yes, Jesus came from the Jewish heritage, praise God. But when you come to the church, you are one with the Gentiles. And those Gentiles who are the Roman citizens, oh, you are some prestigious people because you are the citizens of Rome by birth probably. But when that slave who is working for you, when he walks into the church, he is again equal to you in the body of Christ. There is no hierarchy. And that's how the body of Christ works with the leading of the Holy Spirit. And Paul uses the metaphors for talking about the church as the temple of God, right? You yourselves are the temple of God. Can you see these items have been brought from various places, various quarries, uh, various uh, uh, rocks, and they're all brought together in a unified way in the Old Testament to worship the Lord. And then Paul uses the metaphor for the church unity as the body of Christ. Or we call him Abba Father and we are the children of God. No matter who we are, we come and we become one brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Paul uses the metaphor about the body. That means... 
the family of God and the body. That means we have different organs in our body. Every organ has a different work. But at the end of the day, the whole body is coordinating for oneness because the, that's the purpose of the body. Whatever the hand does, the leg has to coordinate. Maybe we work differently, our gifts are different and our ministry is different, but it's all to bring unity in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, moving forward, the last one, and I want to finish with the time of prayer. The Spirit's ministry is to perfect us, to make us perfect, to be led by the Spirit so that we are made perfect, spotless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul uses in his writings two areas where the Spirit gives us. One is the spiritual gifts, in spiritual gifts, you can find, I do not have time, uh, you can find in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans chapter 12, Ephesians chapter 4, you can find various mention of the spiritual gifts, which are some are miraculous gifts, some are spoken gifts, some are helping gifts. You can go home and read that. You are already aware of the word of God. In 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, Ephesians 4, we can find the mention of various gifts. Basically, it comes to three kinds of gifts that are exercised through our tongue, uh, 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 speaking like preaching and teaching and all that and then miraculous gifts of, of preaching and healing and prophesying miraculous gifts charismatic gifts and then the gifts of work that enables us to serve God in hospitality and administration and various kinds of gifts so it is the spirit of God that enables us to use our gifts for the kingdom's purpose. So that Ephesians says, Paul says that some are prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, and apostles, Paul says, so that the church of God may be built up. So we use our spiritual gifts and we bring it together in the body of Christ. And when one exercises the spiritual gifts, everybody is built up. And it is not only for the pastor or the worship leader to exercise the spiritual gifts. In Paul's church, it was just a church of around 40 to 50 people, maximum 70 people. Everybody had a song. Everybody had a testimony. Everybody used their spiritual gifts. And everybody in the church was edified. Okay, we may not have that in our corporate worship on a Sunday morning, but that, that is possible in our care cells. When we meet at homes, when we meet in local areas, everybody has an opportunity to sing a song, to testify, to prophesy, to exercise your spiritual gifts. But now, let me stop at the spiritual gifts and let me go to the, uh, the fruit of the Spirit. Okay, Paul gives us two categories. In Galatians chapter 5, he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Nine fruit of the Spirit ending with self-control. What is the fruit of the Spirit? The Spirit's work is in us is to develop Christ-likeness into His people. So it starts with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. And when you study that, we just had a study uh, in our castle about the fruit of the Spirit. Every fruit take, takes us back to Jesus and tells us that, okay, Jesus had kindness. We need to be kind like that. And it is developing Christ-likeness in us. And the way Paul puts it, it is not only me individually developing the fruit of the Spirit but that fruit is exercised in the community. How can I learn to love if I cannot love my brother in the community? How can I experience peace if I cannot experience peace in the community? You see, the spiritual gifts are to be exercised personally and more importantly in the community. Fruit of the Spirit. And when you have the foundation of the fruit of the Spirit, based on that foundation of love and Christ-likeness, when you exercise the, the gift of the Spirit, then who is glorified? The Trinitarian God is glorified when we use our gifts based on the fruit of the Spirit. Many people have come and told me, Pastor, this man is a man of God. His preaching is good, but when you talk to him, somehow I don't feel connected. What's wrong with that person? He has not rooted his character, his fruit, based on the fruit of the Spirit. But God has given him a spiritual gifting. He's very good at preaching. He's very good at leading worship. He's very good at castles. Wow, gifting is good. But where is the fruit? So that's where the Spirit leads us. It's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Not only to empower us with spiritual gifts, 
but also to mature a believer in the character and the image of Christ. So when you and I allow the Holy Spirit to mature us and bring us to the character of Christ as much as possible and we yield under the Spirit to produce that fruit in the community, starting from our own lives, our family and the community at large, from that background, if you exercise the spiritual gifts, when you exercise your teaching and preaching and prophesying, who is glorified? There is no confusion. God, the Trinitarian God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit is glorified in the church and in the unity of the church. Amen? The Spirit's ministry perfects us both producing individual and corporate gifts and fruits and perfects the church of God at large. Amen? The essential nature of the fruit is the reproduction of the life of Christ in the believer and the believing community. At conversion, divine perfection does not set in. Look at that. But divine infection does. At conversion. But we need to work with the Holy Spirit, with the word of God and the community of God's people so that we are divinely made perfect, divinely produce the fruit and we use our gifts and God uses us for his divine ministry. Amen? Dear friends, if the spirit of God is invited into our lives, I tell you on Sunday mornings when we come over here, it will transform our worship. And I'm praying for such days where we are so led by the Spirit of God. Sunday morning when we come here, we have only one agenda, to lift up Jesus. And he will transform every one of us. Spirit-filled worship, Spirit-led worship brings heaven in all his wholeness fullness and beauty on earth and the church is the arena which the heavenly invasion plays itself out and Sunday morning is an extended colony of heaven and when we meet together as a colony of heaven and when we disperse after Sunday morning and go into our homes and our schools and colleges and corporates we take the presence of heaven with us and we become as influence, light, and the salt of this world. When I conclude, open your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 4 onwards. We do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live according with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit defies. Where is your mindset today, this morning? That's what you need to ask. Are your mind set on the flesh? It will fail. It will fail. But if your mind is set on the Spirit, it will accomplish what the Spirit desires of you. Read verse 5 once again. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God, verse 7. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Verse 9, Paul exhorts, You, are, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. This is the summary of the message. Verse 12. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. 
but it is not to the flesh to live according to it verse 13 for if you live according to the flesh you will die but if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of your body you will live allow the spirit to work in and through us verse 14 for those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again rather the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship and by him we cry our father the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children can the church shout an amen